Hello. Hey, how you doing? I'm not too bad. Not too bad Marvelous. at all. Marvellous. Um, Good to hear. You uh, We spoke earlier on and you told me about a tree. Yeah. I'm gutted, man. So we're talking on the day that Dumbledore's died. Uh, yeah, that means a lot more for you than it does for me because I've never watched does. any of those because so I was that, an adult those, when they came for, out. But, yeah. for, our, for our lovely listeners, today is the day that I'm recording that um, Michael Gambon passed away, sadly. Mm-hmm. I thought that was bad news enough. Um, however, I then found out that the... The Sycamore Gap tree, or also known as the Robin Hood tree, um, got chopped down last night by, it appears to be, a 16-year-old now. Mm. 16-year-old has been arrested. I don't, that's the latest news. Um, the, I just heard it on Six Music that he is, this guy is helping with inquiries. <laughs> yeah, that old classic. Um, but it's it's one of probably the most iconic trees in the country. Yep, and I love it. I think it's awesome. Uh, I was, I was. <laughs> now we're talking past tense. I am quite chuffed that I did get to see it a couple of times. Um, I didn't manage to get up to it close, but I did see it from the main road, and it's just sad. It's just really sad, and completely unnecessary because all that happened was it was chopped down and then left. Yeah. So there's no. Uh, there's no no one's made any gain out of it. It's not no. been chopped down to, um, I don't know, to sell the wood or anything like that. It's just it, just it, like it, it seems it, like an act of vandalism, and that's it. Yeah, just some kid having a laugh, and yeah. I'd chop his hands off. <laughs> going it's, on, uh, going on, absolutely going bizarre. on the Robin Hood Prince of Thieves classic. I think the punishment back then would have been. Chop his hands off. Oh, okay, okay, all right. Kevin Costner, Kevin Costner, that, get, but... Kevin Costner was about to get his hand chopped off for stealing bread. So, I say Kevin Costner, Robin Hood was about yeah, to get yeah. his hand off for stealing bread for his mate. Mm-hmm. Um, See, so yeah, I think get this lad's own hands chopped off. That'll, that'll <laughs> learn him. He won't do it again. Right. Uh, <laughs> I'm not sure I agree with that, but um, it's very annoying that someone. <laughs> yeah, I would... don't really, I don't really mean it. I'm just saying it for <laughs> it... comedy, comedy effect, violent yeah. comedy effect. <laughs> it's very annoying that someone would do that for no apparent reason. Just seems yeah, completely bizarre, completely mm. bizarre. Anyway, shall I shall I tell you about today's guest? Yeah, why not? Why not? Go for it. Today's guest is our first from Africa. Wow. And he is a former farmer, which is not easy for me to say, uh, wow, from South that? Africa, who, um, yeah, basically came to veganism through uh, what seems like a fairly, so far for us anyway, unique um, experience of having been a farmer and realised what was going on, what was being mm. done to animals, and then came to veganism that way. So. Uh, he's written a book about his vegan journey as well, uh, right. which is available on his website, which we'll link to in oh. the show notes. And uh, his name is J.H. Burnett, and uh, we'll be speaking to him very shortly. Yeah. It's very exciting. Some of the content of our chat with J.H. is going to be, could be triggering for some people. And um, I put a trigger warning on the show notes and on our social media posts, but there's going to be a lot of talk about animal abuse and uh, suicide. So just be aware if that you think that might affect you, then perhaps this isn't the episode for you. Or if it does affect you, what do they need to do, Wes? Just take care of yourself. If you need to talk to somebody, go talk to them. Um, talk to your friends, talk to your family, talk to anyone that can help. But please, please, please take care of yourself. A bit of it bothered me a little bit. Um, mm-hmm. So if it bothered me enough, then it's going to bother other people that are listening. So please take care of yourself. Thank you. Yeah, there's uh, there's professional help out there. You can reach out to us, but we're not. Well, Wes is a professional, but um, mm. in a in an urgent situation, 
Um, probably yeah, best not, not to send us a message yeah, on Instagram. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not a crisis <laughs> line. <laughs> no. <laughs> but uh, if you if you need support, then there's uh, plenty of places that you can find it. Uh, your local NHS uh, website will be able to help with that. Yeah. It's good to see you guys. Thanks for having me, man. Yeah, yeah. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. And you, man. Um, three, uh, three men with beards. That's uh, that's the kind of setup that we like. So <laughs> crazy stuff. I still have a long way to go. I see. Uh, uh, yeah, 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 yeah. You guys, you guys are looking good. Love the beards. Yeah. <laughs> hey, this this has taken a good eight years. <laughs> it doesn't grow as fast as you think. <laughs> Is it, wow. is it, is it, is it, is it, Jeez, man, I don't have the patience. I tend to neglect <clears throat> mine. I've had a longer one at times, but then I always find myself in a position where, you know, it gets sort of tangled and then my wife would just say, just give it up, man. If you ain't going to take good care of it, just cut it off. So that's <laughs> why, that's why I have a nice short one. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Easier to maintain. Yeah. There's a long, there's a long regime with this after the shower. Oh, I'm not going into that. We'll perhaps do a full episode on it later on another yeah, time. Yeah, where's his, where's his beard care? Thank, thank you so much for joining us. Um, what's the what's the time difference between South Africa and the UK? Because I've um, I always sort of picture it as being straight down from where we are to where you are, but that's not quite correct, is it? So is it is it seven thirty where you're at, right? Yes. Yes. So it's it's eight thirty where I'm at. So one hour oh, okay. before you guys. Yeah, okay. yeah. I actually thought yeah, it was okay. two, but it's it's only one. Awesome. Okay, dokie. Uh, which bit of uh, South Africa are you in? Whereabouts? So I as, as if I know South Africa. Small, yeah, you see, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a uh, anyway. It's down in the Western Cape. Uh, it's a small little remote town right by the ocean called Wilderness, and it's actually quite beautiful. It's um, yeah, it's very forestry, and obviously you've got the long white beaches. But it's in the Western oh. Cape, about about well, it's about six hours drive from from Cape Town, which is the biggest city. Right. Okay, it's a big so, place, man. South Africa is yeah. it's quite it's, it's quite big. <laughs> <laughs> and okay. where about are you? Where about are you guys? Uh, where did you go first? Um, so I'm just north of Manchester, up in the north of England. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, yeah, mm -hmm. I'm in uh, Northamptonshire in the Midlands, which is the sort of the bit that people drive through on their way to somewhere else. Of course, of course, of course. I've only been once um, to the UK and I, and I wanted to. We were driving from Scotland down to London or down to Wales, actually. And then I wanted to drive into Manchester to go have a look at the Etihad Stadium where City plays, oh, yeah. and yes. my wife just wanted, you know, it just, she checked the traffic, and she said, there is no way we're going to get <laughs> anyway, so I never saw just... any of it, I, I saw like, you know, like the outskirts, that was it, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, 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 it's quite, quite difficult to get, and it's not difficult to get to, it's just, if you're, if you're diverting off the motorway, it's a bit of a fair way. Okay. Yeah, if you've got a I long see. trip already, then it's, Probably yeah, not I worth see. a diversion, is it? Yeah. I see. I see. I see. That's good. Okay. So, uh, you a Man City fan then, or is that uh, is that just because it was? Um, no, on the road? I am. No, I am very much a City fan. Um, ah, I, okay. I got lucky in the late two thousands. I had no. Idea. I didn't grow up watching football, but then friends introduced me at college, and then I was looking for a team, and then I I thought that. Who better to support than Manchester United's biggest rival in my mind? Not yes. knowing that City wasn't the biggest rival. But anyway, I got no. lucky because a year later they were bought and then they became this massive, you know, mm. anyway. But it's but what do I know, man? But it's been good. It's been good. Perfect do you guys time. follow football? I do. I was hoping you might be an Everton fan like me because of Stephen Pinar. But um, <laughs> oh, of but, course, of but course, sadly of course. not. No, 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 sadly not. No, no, no. Yeah. <laughs> Never mind. I don't mind. Uh, I don't mind Man City. They're not Man United or um, the, the sure. those who shall not be named. Yeah. Mm. All right. <laughs> Wes is uh, not a football man. No, I'm, mm. I, I don't mind watching it. I'll watch a game and enjoy it for what it is. I'm more, I'm more into me American sports, really. But even then, it's just 
because I enjoy watching it. I'm not sure. I've got I support about six American football teams just because I like the colours. Yeah. Yeah, he likes American American football, (laughs) baseball, ice hockey, and shooting some sports. I've never met someone who, yeah, was interested in that. It's pretty cool. Yeah, I love it. I don't. We won't see. I mean, there's there's some football fans that know the ins and outs of every game for the last fifty years. I don't care. I just watch it and just enjoy it. (laughs) The quarterback throws the ball. Someone catches it. It looks cool. Happy days. (laughs) And there's a big pile of bodies in the middle. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> good stuff good stuff anyway that's not what we're here to talk about obviously the story is a bit of a downer so I don't want to I mean want to go into the sort of details that you know you're not interested in so sort of just leave the yeah I mean but I mean I'm open for anything so that's that's fine <laughs> well I listened um, a couple of days ago to your interview with um, No Bullshit Vegan Podcast. Oh, okay. okay. And cool. I didn't find it a downer at all. It's uh, it's like okay. a redemption tale. It's um, okay. That's good. In the in the intro, I mentioned that you're a former farmer, which is um, sure. I still find that difficult to say. But you 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 came to veganism through farming. So, and that's a, a story that we haven't had on our pod before. So, it's uh, we're we're fascinated by it, really. To be honest with you, so. Um, yeah, take us through it. What's the what's the your long road to veganism? Fantastic. Again, thanks for having me, man. I really do appreciate it. Um, in order to sort of understand my journey, you know, I have to take you back to the specific farm that my family owns in South Africa, in almost like the the heart of South Africa, the Middle East part, which we would call the Great Karoo of South Africa. Um, and what makes this farm quite special i mean depending on how you look at it is that my family has owned it for 253 years so it's the wow. oldest family owned farm in all of south africa right at least to our knowledge so growing up i didn't grow up there. i grew up on another family farm but we went there all the time you know to go visit the grandparents and um I was sort of brainwashed as a child in believing that this farm, right, this all this farm, family-owned farm in South Africa, this is like the best farm in all of South Africa, which it really isn't. It's just you know, any other farm, but you know, at least that was the way that I saw it, and um, that farming at one day would be like the ultimate honor. But it was never on the card. So I had a dream as a young boy, I wanted to farm the farm, and um, uh, I would have been the ninth generation to do so. and But it was never on the cards for me because I was sort of born into the wrong side of the family. Um, so it was never on the cards. But, you know, life has a way of surprising you. So I farmed mm-hmm. another family farm. Mm-hmm. And then in 2018, at the beginning of 2018, that family farm was sold off. And when that happened, I got a phone call asking me, would you be interested because this – this very old family farm has to this day has various shareholders and um, their spokesperson. It sounds very formal, but it was quite formal. Phoned me and said, would you be interested in giving up everything and moving out there to the crew to go take over the farm? And uh, of course, my wife and I absolutely leaped at the opportunity, right? Um, mm-hmm. I left basically immediately me and my two bull terriers, uh, the dogs, um, and my wife stayed behind in our hometown of Worcester because she still had a small business and she needed a couple of months to close that down. And uh, so me and the two dogs left immediately. We were so excited, me and my wife, you know, to be a part of the history of it all, you know. Um, mm-hmm. As I said, I was... I was going to be the ninth generation of my family to to farm it. And um, so we're very sentimental, you know, about the whole thing. We, of course, we didn't come from a, we don't come from a vegan background. I went into farming in this case. Um, as I said, I was already a farmer, but I farmed with all those before this. So then I went into sheep farming. Of course, I knew I was going to be farming with sheep, but it didn't bother me because I wasn't a vegan at the time. I had no animal libera- uh, liberation background. 
I'd never spoken to another vegan. Can you imagine this? I was 29 years old at the time. And I'd never even met another vegan in my life up to that point. Mm. So I'd never read a book on animal liberation. I'd never seen a documentary. No, nothing. So went into the farming, not knowing what I was going to get into. Very sentimental about the whole thing. And as the story goes, literally from the get-go, from the very first day on the job, it just wasn't a good fit. I started making the one vegan connection after the other. And I refer to them as love connections where you just, I saw certain things. I challenged the way it was done. I, I viewed it as immensely cruel. I wasn't happy with the answers that I received. And it sort of started challenging you know, my wife and I and um, our morals and it led us to veganism. So um, you said you didn't have any um, uh, like connection to animal liberation or, or veganism or anything like that. Had, were you even aware that it was a thing? Did you even know that veganism existed or anything? Just never come across. You'd never come across it before. This is going to sound quite funny, right? I remember <laughs> this is this is ridiculous. I know. But I remember telling my wife at one stage, this is my way before we ever moved to the farm. Veganism wasn't the thing where I come from, right? Mm -hmm. uh, as I said, I've never met another vegan at that point. But I remember hearing about this vegan move and people who don't eat animal products. And I remember, and I'm even, I'm even embarrassed to say this a lot, but I remember asking my wife, why, <laughs> why don't these people like animals? In my mind, I couldn't make the connection. It was as if the people who didn't eat animals, what did they have against animals? It was <laughs> so my my perspective was warped. I mean, severely warped, like <laughs> to the point where I saw veganism as a movement of people who didn't like animals. Can you believe it? it's crazy? Yeah, that's incredible. I I do kind of get it though. In the, yeah, because it's in the sense you've yeah it's in you've kind of got the wrong end of the stick and you've thought oh they don't eat animals because they don't like animals or they don't like the taste of animals rather than sure. they're doing it because they like animals yeah yeah, <laughs> so, yeah. In, in, okay. even in my mind it wasn't because they didn't like the taste of animals it was because they had something against animals it, yeah it, it makes no sense but as you said you put it well now i just got the wrong end of the stick and I ran with it for, and then I put yeah. it out of my mind right yeah. so what, one thing that I'm really curious about is someone asked you to come and run a farm had you done like had you been trained in running a farm or anything because I don't feel like it's something that you can just like turn up and do no, I wouldn't have thought not. anyway no. so, so at that point as I said I was I was farming or I had farmed another family farm for several years and it was an olive okay. farm so I had work in an agricultural setup. So the trust was there. But then the other sure. thing was at this new farm, the sheep farm, my grandfather, who was already 80 years old at the time, he was still there living and working on the farm. Sure. So the idea was, um, the idea sold to me was that JH, move to the farm, go work under your grandfather's leadership for yeah. two years, learn everything there is to know, then he's going to retire and you're going to take over the farm and lead it into the mm. future. So that was sure. the idea. So I still had his knowledge to fall back on when I moved it, yes. Sure. Yeah. So okay. what happened that, then, that when, was... you, when, you, when you realised that that was, that, that, that it wasn't sitting right, what was the next step then after that? Well, if you don't, maybe I should just share one or two stories because I said what had happened was on the very yeah. first morning when I went there, I remember I was just sort of the silent observer. I didn't go in thinking that I, I knew I knew nothing, right? So I was there and just basically with the mindset, teach me all you have to know, right? So then the guys working on the farm, I went with them on the very first morning on the farm to a um to the pens where they worked with the sheep right on inverted commas and what they were doing on this specific morning they were docking the sheep meaning cutting off of the sheep of the little tiny lambs tails right and i was standing there in a the corner 
shocked by the whole experience because here were these big guys, you know, grabbing these tiny lambs and cutting off their tails with old, rustic garden scissors of all things. And of course, there was a lot of, you know, screaming and, you know, of the, the, sh the poor lambs, man, if they could talk, you know, yeah. They would have, they were, would have wept for their mothers, and they would have been like, "What are you doing to us, guys?" It was brutal from my perspective. Blood everywhere, and uh, I asked a couple of questions, and I was sort of put in my place. And the guy said, "No, this is just the way it's always been." But all throughout mm -hmm. that day, my heart was troubled by this experience, right? And, and when the evening came, I drove out to the field where the sheep slept for the night. And I just wanted to go check up on them, right? I just wanted to go make sure that these tiny lambs are okay. And in reaching the flock, there were these two tiny, frail little lambs bleeding profusely from the morning's docking, right? And they were so weak by this point. They were completely covered in blood, their hind sides. And they were so weak, they could no longer walk. And cruel as nature can be, the flock had already given up on them, and they had already sort of one, began, began wandering off the night, including their own mother, saying, quite cruel. Um, but, you know, as I said, nature can be quite cruel sometimes. But leaving behind these two tiny, bleeding little lambs, and they were calling out to the rest of the flock, and they struggled to walk, and it just completely broke my heart. So I mm. did the only thing that I knew to do and as I took them home with me and I took them literally this is now my first evening on the job and I took them into our house um, had having just moved in and I took them into our house and I made them a, little, a nice little bed on the kitchen floor and I you know put down some pillows and blankets and I treated their wounds to the best of my abilities and I fed them some nice lamb formula milk and I just sat them, sat with them for most of the evening, just loving on them, right? And I just looked into their eyes and I just made that vegan connection. I could just see the sentience there. And I just knew that these poor little lambs, man, they, they have the ability to feel love and fear and hope. And they are looking up at me, you know, with these hopeful eyes, almost like, please change my good man, please save us. And, um, oh man, it just broke my heart, man. Um, and I remember sitting there with them and my two bull terriers were literally in the room next door, um, separating us with just basically a single door. And I remember sitting there and just thinking to myself, you know, here are these two dogs. And at the time, I felt as if I would be willing to lay my life down for these two dogs. I love them so much, right? And still do. The one, unfortunately, has passed away since then. The other one is still with us today. Um, you know, I love them to bits. I lay my life down for them. But what is the difference between them and these two frail little lambs bleeding on my kitchen floor? What's the difference? How can I love the one and eat them? the other it, it made no sense to me and um so i started asking those questions and literally the next well the next morning as life would have it they had passed away in the evening and i phoned my wife and she was crying and i was crying and that's how our vegan journey started you know on the job seeing certain things it didn't make sense we questioned it we weren't happy with the answers and it sort of led us to veganism if you mm -hmm. if you don't mind i just want to add uh, of, of, i mean you can imagine that there are countless of these stories but like a week later i was sitting early in the morning i was sitting with my two bull terriers on the back porch looking you know at the sunrise and um one of the guys working on the farm, he walked past my yard. It was, you know, before the, the day's work was to begin. And the guy passed me and we greeted one another. And I was sitting there drinking my coffee. And I was watching him from, you know, the corner of my eye. And he went into what we called the sick pen, which was a small little cage, basically, where they kept the 
the sick, weak little lambs, because sometimes, you know, uh, she mm. will have, for example, will have twins and she won't have milk for both. And then one would end up in the sick pen, for example. And uh, yeah. he entered the sick pen. And the next moment I saw him drag out a lamb by its hind legs. And I thought to myself, what on earth is going on there? What is he doing? And, but I thought maybe the sheep, the lamb had passed in the evening and he's just sort of taking it out of the sheep. And, but the next moment I saw that the lamb was kicking, right? I was like, leave me, man. What are you doing? Why are you dragging me? Um, and I sort of sat forward and thinking, what on earth is going on here? And the next moment, this guy picked up a rock and he started oh. beating down on this tiny, frail, innocent little being. And I'm jumping up and the dogs are barking, as you can only imagine. And my coffee, you know, is falling to the floor and I'm running across the porch. And, you know, as life would have it, I'm struggling with the garden gate, struggling to get it open. And, um, and I'm shouting at this guy to quit it, you know, stop, stop, what are you doing? And I'm running, you know to him and this guy whether he couldn't hear me or refused to do so i still i don't know to this day but finally i reached him he was just continuing beating down on this lamb reaching i pushed him to the ground and i just fell you know to the ground next to this tiny little lamb as it was literally breathing its last breath and i was just held it in my in my arms and i was just weeping and i just remember it is as if my mind couldn't process what had just happened. I, mm. I just kept on saying over and over for at least five minutes, why, why, why? That single word, why, 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 is as if I could. I wanted to stop asking why, but I couldn't. Something happened in my, my mind, couldn't process what had happened. So there was a sitting, weeping, shouting, why, 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 why? So... Yeah, there were countless similar mm. stories and um, just had a, a profound impact on our lives, both my wife and mine. So That's how incredible. did you turn that? Yeah, that is really amazing. How did you turn that from uh, sort of despair and sadness and frustration at what was being done on the farm into uh, into your veganism? What was the sort of lots of small steps or one big step? What was sure. How did that go? So, so we basically, both my wife and I basically quit eating meat almost immediately. I think it took me about three weeks from moving to the farm to the point you know, where I stopped eating meat. And so too wow. did my wife. At the time, it took her four months to move to the farm. But, you know, within three weeks of me moving there, <laughs> just through the stories that she heard, wow. <laughs> she was no longer eating meat, right? Now, the question, obviously, that one can, can ask is why didn't I, and then later the two of us, why didn't we move away? Because obviously it didn't align with our new vegan morals, but yeah. it's a complex and it was a complex situation because when I went vegan, although we never called ourselves vegan because we felt unworthy of the title because we were still being paid off of the backs of the suffering animals, although we... we we stopped eating meat, right, or and dairy and, and all of it, but we didn't feel worthy of the titles. But we, we all of a sudden got a new vision of turning this farm into a sanctuary. And I knew if I can hang in there for two years, as a deal was supposed to be, then I'm going to take over from my grandfather, and I can turn it into sanctuary. So instead of leaving. Because I knew no good's going to come of it if I leave. I have to hang in there because in our minds, it was going to be this beautiful vegan utopia. And, and again, there was a lot of sentiment to this thought because if you can imagine at that point, you know, the farmers uh, had been in, or would have been in our in our bloodline, if I can put it so, for around about 250 mm. years. Can you imagine all the blood that was spilled in those 250 mm. years mm. due to the meat yeah. industry? Now, now imagine turning that into a vegan utopia. So we we decided, no, we're going to hang in there. And we had a couple of opportunities to move away. And very often I would come home in the evenings and I would tell my wife, X, Y, and Z happened today and I can't stand it anymore. I can't stand the blood and the gore anymore. 
I think we should just move away. And then we will sit down, look one another in the eyes and just say, no, we've got this vegan dream. And so we started building a, a business plan for a self-sustaining vegan utopia, like a, like an animal oh. sanctuary, right? So that really motivated us to keep going. So this neighbor of ours phoned me you know, late this afternoon and they were in the process of moving away and he said, listen, JH, as you know, you know, I still wanted to swing by your guys' place and just to come say thank you for everything. But unfortunately, I'm running out of time. So I'm just, hence the call. We're leaving early tomorrow morning. This is it. Thank you for everything. Bye-bye. And we shared a couple of thoughts. And as I was about to hang up the phone, right, I was already sort of on my way of putting down the phone. <laughs> I got this ping from the universe. And I said, wait, 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 hang on. And it was like, yeah, yeah, what's, what's happening? And I said, you know, the last time I was over there at your place, I remember seeing these three little Indian runner ducks. Now, I don't know if you guys have ever seen Indian runner ducks, but they are the cutest thing alive. If ever if any of the listeners haven't seen them, please do yourself a favor and go Google it. Um, they are almost funny looking, but the cutest thing alive. I said, I remember you, you have three Indian runner ducks. What are going to happen to them? And he said, well, funny you should ask. One of the guys who worked for me, you know, I just given them for this guy or for these guys, there were three guys working there. I, I gave each of them a runner duck and they had just come to collect them and they're on their way now to the one guy's house to go cook them for dinner. Oh. And I said, wow. not on my watch. And I remember <laughs> I jumped in the car and rushed over to his place. And as I say, it's like 30 Ks gravel road right so you can only go so fast and then um, eventually got there went over to these guys' house said please guys can i get these little runner ducks and the guy said no they were gifted to us and i said well i'll buy them from you so i ended up buying the runner ducks from them took them home and so my wife and I said, okay, oh, well, this is the start of our little sanctuary. So we started this very unofficial <laughs> little sanctuary with three Indian runner ducks. And we said, we're not going to go looking for more animals. The right animals will find us. And um, yeah. as life would have it, we blinked twice and we had more than 50 animals <laughs> living there with us. Um all you know that come from horrible circumstances so we so that kept us going you know it was this unofficial sanctuary and every night we would go sit there with them with a guitar and a, and a cup of coffee or a glass of wine and just love on them and just spend time with these animals and we just drew inspiration from that and kept an eye on the future you know to the day where we could turn the farm into a sanctuary so yeah, so you had the okay. tough, you had the blood and the gore. And I never shied away from that. I always made sure that I knew what was going on. I saw the fear and I saw the blood, although I never did the killing myself. I was, I saw it for what it was. I knew how wrong it was and I didn't just want to turn my back on it. I, I, I didn't want to be disconnected, but I wanted to feel everything there was to be felt. That was on the one hand and on the other hand, you had this lovely little animal sanctuary at the back of our house. So you had these opposite worlds. Yeah, it's, it's, it's a hectic story. It's mad. It's, it's, like, it's just incredible that, that's, that that all happened. Just mad. Fair play to you. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. It's, um, that's a really incredible. Of course, you know, you had, um, you had a quite you know tough time, but then what happened was right on a verge where we, we ended up spending um, about three years there and right on the verge of us having to take over. COVID was already at, you know, we were at the height of COVID and the shareholders weren't making money and there was like big scale droughts in the region. And then they started backpedaling on their commitments to my wife and I and said, no, they, you know, they're losing too much money. The deal ain't going to work. They want to sell off the farm, right? And... Um, so some of the shells said, no, we want to sell off the farm. Some of the shells said, no, 
we made a commitment to JH and his wife, Al, we can't backpedal. So then all of a sudden, they, these two groups were in a fight of one another and we weren't involved. We were basically just spectators looking in on the chaos and the fighting. And uh, they end up taking one another to court and they just said, you know, for the time being, while this court case runs its course, Everybody needs to move away from the farm. They're going to rent it out to the neighbors. And um, unfortunately, you know, JH and I will also have to move away until, you know, this court case is settled. It was a big story and it's still going on. It's almost three years what? later. They still fight oh in court. And uh, so there we were at the end of 2020 in absolute dire straits. This is my wife and I, hard broken because a couple of things our dream is now gone right so mm. we could no longer we we in our minds we're on the verge of losing the farm okay we could potentially move back there one day but there's no guarantee so we had just witnessed you know the as i said the blood and the gore for almost three years now the vision of the sanctuary is gone and on top of all of this we have to give up our own little sanctuary, which at the time had more than 60 animals in it, right? So we were completely heartbroken. And what's more is we were in financial dire straits because we had spent all of our money taking care of the animals in a little sanctuary. We had no support, right? We never asked for a dime. And um, we now had to rehome them to other sanctuaries and to, you know, to good houses and we had to pay good people. We end up paying like for a, for feed a year in advance. So we ended up leaving the farm at the end of 2020, heartbroken, severely depressed myself, severely depressed because of the of the blood and the gore witness. Um, the dream was gone, um, and. It, yeah, so that's 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 in the state in which we left with you know COVID being you know as it was, especially in the third world country. I mean, there were no economic you know prospects on the horizon. We were ruined financially. So, um, and um, yeah, so that <laughs> I don't want to. I don't want to take up the entire conversation, but I just want to say that, and, I, and I'll tell you more about it if you want to know, but that is how I ended up being almost lured and tricked into the dairy industry of all things, not knowing that it was being, you know, that there was waiting for me in the US. We, we definitely want to hear about how you got tricked into it. <laughs> <laughs> Good stuff. I'm glad. I'm, I'm so glad to hear that because <laughs> I want to talk about it, man. It's, it's it was it was a terrible situation. So as I said, we were in dire straits. I was on Facebook the one day, um, and um, I was connected with a with a very old friend of mine, and uh, he was living in. I think he still is. We had lost contact anyway. He was living in the states in in America, and. Um, him and I started talking and he knew nothing of my life and I knew nothing of his life. And it's just the next moment, you know, not even knowing my personal circumstances, he said, JH, would you ever consider moving to America? Because um, he said that he is in the process, he helps to recruit South African guys to go work there for a local farmer in North Dakota. And I was, you know, being in dire straits, I was like, man, if this can help us survive financially, sure. Connect me with the farmer, which he then did. The next day, I got a call from the farmer. Him and I spoke for like an hour. He took a liking in me. Um, you know, I don't really understand his reason behind it, but he was... I had done a master's degree in organizational leadership and he sort of, he said, yeah, I need, this is what I need. I need a good manager to come in. And he said, he, he has like a lot of problems of the guys working for him, all South Africans and their relationships are all broken between him and them. And he needs me to come and, and intervene and, you know, be a middleman between, between him and them. And he had this, he pitched this big vision to me and, and I was all excited about it. And I said, 
just tell me one thing, man. Are there any animals on the farm? Because by then you can only imagine how fed up I was for the animal in you know yeah. farming industry. I wanted nothing to do with it. And he said, and I, I'll never know his reasoning for it, but he said, I'll never forget it. He said, not unless you count the dog. And him, him and I sort of shared a laugh because he was telling me that, you know, they are grain producers, right? That this is what they do. And this is the, the area of the farm that I'm going to be working in, you know. And um, so I went there. My wife stayed behind in South Africa, went all by my lonesome and with the literally with the last money we had, I bought a plane ticket. And two weeks later, I rocked up there in North Dakota in the middle of nowhere, in the middle of nowhere. Um, and as we were driving into this guy's farm, there was a massive feedlot with, you know, approximately two and a half thousand dairy cows in it. And I thought, well, it must, surely it belongs to a neighbor. Just to find out, no, 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 this feedlot belongs to this farmer. I'm not going to be working in this industry. It was, my mind was blown. It was, it all happened so fast. And I, I struggled to make sense of it all. And, but fortunately I was, I was working, you know, in a different sector of the farm, but it really bothered me. And on, well, whilst working there for the first couple of days, I sort of kept an eye on the feedlot and I saw that there were countless deceased cows lying spread out through the feedlot, dead, trampled to semi mints in their own dung. Some of them, you know, had severed limbs and, you know, their skulls were crushed. It was brutal. It was absolutely oh. brutal. So on my first Sunday, my first afternoon off was a Sunday afternoon, it was my first Sunday then. I asked the farmer, listen, do you mind? You don't have to pay me. Can I take the skid steer and can I at least take these cows from the feedlot? Because I asked the guy who, who operated the feedlot, right? He was a R Ukrainian guy. I asked him at one point in that week leading up to that Sunday, when are you going to take these cows, these deceased cows from the pens? This is brutal, man. And he took offense by my question and, and he basically said, Never, right? And he said they can trample them into the dirt for all I care. I'll never forget those were his words, using well with a couple of swear words mm -hmm. or so forth. He was really offended by my question. So I ended up asking the phone, this is how, you don't have to pay me. Can I at least just give them a proper burial? So he said, that's fine. So I took the skid steer, took them out, and then I got the call and said, no, you can't bury them. You have to stack them beside the feedlot. Right, you have to stack them there. And whilst taking them out, man, I was just weeping. It just broke my heart seeing these cows in this in this state. You know, as I said, severed limbs, and you know, can you imagine being trampled to death and into the mud? You know, to say my months by your own friends and family. Can you believe? I mean, it's 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 yeah. crazy. So I, I stacked them there, and I was like crying. And finally, I was done. And uh, I write in my book, I said it was 22 deceased cars, right? But it was way more than that. I just ended up taking photos of, of 22. Some of them I couldn't get to. And why I took the photos is because I was, as I was leaving for the house, weeping, I got a phone call from a farmer said, listen, you have to go back. You have to go take photos of the deceased cow's ears because they have tags in their ears oh, so yeah. that I know as a farmer, I can know which cows you took out of the pen. And I said, or out of the pens, I said, how am I supposed to do that? You're looking at a mountain of deceased cows. I mean, you look at about approximately 36 cows or something like that, right? How am I going to get to the, the cows in the middle? I was basically just said, listen, you just make a plan, man. So picture me climbing a mountain of deceased rotten carcasses, scratching and clawing my way to look for these ear tags and the smell oh. and the sight, man, it just, it just broke me. I was already mm. depressed, but it was, it just broke me. And unfortunately things went from bad to worse because the farmer really liked that act. You know, the fact that I was willing, you know, that I suggested it and I was willing to do it for free and he was like, 
he made it like into a religious thing, right? He said, now I've been praying for someone like you, you know, somebody who gives a damn, you know, and I feel like, you know, you were sent here for a reason. And and yeah. so he told me, he told me, he said, listen, the guy who ran the feedlot, he's been doing it for 15 years. But apparently he said, I heard via the grapevine that this guy's going to leave my service in a couple of months' time. But I'm not going to let him catch me, JH. You know, I'm going to catch him before he catches me. So I'm going to, you know, out of the old, I'm going to kick him out and I'm going to put you in charge. You are now the new leader of the feedlot. And I was like, no way, Jose. There's, there's, there's no way. You don't understand. I am yeah. so against what is happening in this feedlot because trust me, if ever you know if ever there was a hell if hell is real it's it's you know you can find it at your local feedlot the things that i saw at a distance was just brutal beyond all comparison so as i said i want nothing to do with it and he said basically my way or the highway he pointed to you know the gravel road leading away from his farm he said you see that road there you want to take that road and it's going to lead to a tar road and you can hitchhike your way to the nearest town and if you take this road you can hitchhike to the city which is like three hours drive if you ain't gonna do what i tell you you're gone yeah. and um, i went home that that evening and i'm really ashamed by it but i i made the decision to stay and to take over the feedlot knowing that it was the wrong thing to do but in my mind you know i was like if i don't do it I'm not going to get paid at the end of the week, which means which means we're not going to have we're not going to have a roof over our heads. Even my wife back home, we're not going to have food to eat. You know? So you know, once mine tends to run away with you in moments like that. But I I, I stayed and I started running this guy's feedlot, and I did so for about a hundred days, um, which involved uh, the artificial inseminating of approximately 50 dairy cows per day, which oh oh. absolutely broke me. And I'm not the victim. I just want to make that as clear as daylight. I'm not the victim. The real victims were the cows, and the cows were still you know, living in these atrocious circumstances. But there I was, a lover of, animal, of animals, with my biggest vision of wanting to serve the vegan animal liberation movement, now artificially inseminating dairy cows, up to 50 cows per day sometimes. It's, so the, the depression just kicked in, like you won't believe, working sometimes 16 hours a day in, in tough conditions and, and being a part of that, it, it was, it was poisonous. Um, mm. I tried to make the most of it. I would go in early in the mornings, like a half an hour before the day would start. And I would just go love on the cows. And we would, we would, yeah, I would just stand there in the middle of the pens and they would just come and they're so kind and gentle and curious and they'll always be sniffing and always nibbling at your suit because you're wearing these thick suits because now you're working in the North Dakota in the winter, you know, minus 38 degrees Celsius. And, and we would, me and the cows would sometimes kick a football around. And if you've ever seen happiness, it's a bunch of cows running around playing a football. So mm -hmm. I was sort of torn into, you know, just loving the cows and doing my best to, to treat them as nicely as humanly possible under tough circumstances. But then again, Man, yeah, as you can imagine, you know, the, the, the artificial insemination process is nothing to laugh about. It's, um, no. it's exploitation to the worst degree. So the, the depression just, for me, it just kicked in and to the point where I, I had no will to live anymore. That must have been really, so how really did you, how did you how did you get out of it all then? Mm. So one night I... Me and the guys working on the farm, we lived in this dilapidated house at the side of a of like this old forest. 
And the one night when I was so depressed, I just wandered into the woods and uh, it was snowing in a thick snow and I was wandering into the woods. And uh, I remember going and I sat down by the small little creek and I had this old little rustic blade in my pocket and I was beginning to fiddle away you know, at my wrist. I was just sort of making these tiny cuts and I'm, and I'm just in that moment just saying that this is it for me, man. I'm just just going to end it right here, man. I cannot stand to wake up tomorrow morning and continue this brutality. The, the animal, the meat and dairy industries has now killed me for good. I'm going to cut mm. off my wrist. This is my end right here. And wow. uh, it was pitch black, right? It was dark outside. And um, in that moment, sitting by that creek, an enormous elk with these gigantic antlers came walking straight towards me from the opposite side of the creek. He came walking down the slope right at me. And I was sitting there thinking, this, this can't be. Surely this elk must be able to see me. I'm seeing him, for goodness sake. I mean, I'm like 10 meters away from him. Surely he must see me. And if he can't see me, surely he must be able to smell me, right? But still, it kept on walking straight at me. So I started backpedaling somewhat. And uh, I'm just sitting there observing this glorious animal and just trying to get my head around it. Why is it still approaching the creek and in the process of approaching me? And then I saw, you know, at second glance, I saw that it had been shot. I'm saying it because I, I don't know if it was a he or a she. I still don't know to this day. But it had been shot in the face of all places, right, in the bottom jaw, and that its entire bottom jaw was dangling in the wind. So his entire bottom jaw was removed from his face, was dangling like a wet cloth in the wind. There was blood everywhere. And again, my heart just broke. And just said, I could not believe. I'm thinking, like, what are we as a species doing to these poor animals, right? So this animal, this elk, was so desperate for water in his or her last minutes alive, because it was surely going to die. There was no way that it would have survived that gunshot, right? It was so desperate that it, that it, was, it just needed to get to that water, come how high water, you know, despite me sitting right there. And it stuck its face to the water, and it tried drinking water, and um, it wandered off into the night. Surely, you know, on his way to go lie down somewhere, somewhere and just, you know, die off. And I began to follow its trail. And it was quite easy to do because I had this small cell phone light and it was bleeding profusely. So you've got red blood in and on white snow. So it was quite easy to follow his tracks, right? So I ended up following it for several hours that night. Finally, I lost its trail, but whilst walking, whilst following its trail, I just, I just dedicated my life to the cause, to the animal liberation cause. I just found the will to live and the will to continue fight within me. I just knew in that moment, no, this does not need to be the end for me. I can still turn it around. I can turn my life around and I can... I can fight for what's good. I can, this doesn't have to be the end of my story. You know, it's, it's, it's the end of a, of a couple of horrific chapters, but I can still hopefully inspire others through what I went through and what I saw firsthand. And um, I never went back to work. I resigned the following day, never went back to work. The farmer actually took it quite well. He said, well, you know, you're always welcome back. It was a joy having you, but it is what it is. Uh, and he organized a lift for me to the city, which is like three hours away. And, uh, and I came home not knowing what's going to wait for me on this side because COVID was still very much, you know, it was still you know, at the height of COVID, not knowing what our lives are going to look like, how we're going to sustain ourselves, but all of a sudden, none of it mattered. I, and I say I, but I mean, my wife is a way better person than I am. And she's, 
my biggest cheerleader. She never wanted me to go to stage in the first place. The, the, the first evening I phoned her and, and, and told her of the feedlot, long before I started working in the feedlot, she said, just come home. Just come home. Just follow yeah, your yeah. heart. You're not, you're not following your heart. So things ain't going to work for you, Jade. You've got to come home. Of course, I didn't listen. But finally, I came home. And so there we were, my wife and I, you know, in 2021, having to rebuild our lives. And finally, we could call ourselves vegans, although we had stopped eating meat mm -hmm. and dairy long, many years before this. But we were now free, man. We were no longer getting paid yeah. off of the backs of innocent animals. So we could now live bold and happy vegan lives and, and just rebuild our lives, yeah. Wow. What a story, that, man. That's incredible. You've seen some you've seen some bad stuff there. That's uh <laughs> that's incredible. Uh, to come out the other side like like that elk kind of dragged you through, didn't it? Even in its yeah. last minutes. Sure, yeah. sure. That's incredible. He's death, so now, he's, he's death almost saved my life. Yeah. Yeah. yeah it's, it's it's incredible. I couldn't have written a better story, you know. It's mm. truth can really be stranger and I guess more profound yeah. than fiction sometimes. Definitely. So you're you're back in South Africa now. Um you've written a book about your sure. experiences and also yeah. uh some children's books as well. Sure, 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 sure. So I, I went home and I started writing my book. It, it's called Ex Farmer Goes Vegan, right? I wanted to make the title as self-explanatory as possible. Yeah. I think I managed to do that. So, <laughs> yeah. so, But it was a tough ride, let me tell you. I mean, I still sometimes have nightmares reliving some of the stuff that I saw. So I would write for a day or two and then I would have to take a break. And mm -hmm. the children's book books came into play when in those moments where I needed to take a break, where I needed to approach veganism from a, a fun and colorful light. So that's how I got involved with children's literature, not because I set out to do so, but because I needed a break from, you know, the, the severity of writing my own book. So um, my wife then, when I finished the first children's book, my wife was inspired. She said, you know, change. I really love this book. Um, and I want to do, I was a part of this journey. I want to do the illustrations. So she began teaching oh, herself okay. to do the illustrations. And today she's a full-time illustrator. Life can no be way. crazy, man. Yeah, so she's illustrated all the children's books. She was very involved with my, with my own book, Ex Farmer Goes Vegan. Um, and at the same time, I just, I just wanted to give back, right? So started volunteering yeah. at a lot of vegan organizations. And at the same time, I started a small little coaching, life coaching practice because I had just survived suicide and severe depression so i wanted to give back and um and that took off quite nicely so i spent like a year and a half to two years doing a lot of coaching helping helping people i mean as i said it was the height of COVID. many people were searching for answers and people were scared and so it was just a timing thing you know it came at a good time and then at the end of last year at the end of 2022 my wife and I just made a call and said, we want to go in full time in this vegan thing. We just, we've been through so much and we've seen so much. We just want to, we just want to take it to the next level. We just want to, we just want to lay it all down and see what's going to come of it. And uh, in the process, I finished my book. We started a website. We ended up taking on way too much. I, I closed the coaching practice. <laughs> I started coaching only in the vegan space, which was tremendous. Um, just a quick story. We're in the process of collaborating with another vegan group. I can't say too much about it, but I just want to put this out there. It's a beautiful little story. I was contacted by a mom in the UK. And she said, I saw that you do coaching, life coaching in the vegan space. My son is 10 years old 
and uh, he's being severely bullied at school because he's a vegan and oh, he's wow. saying that he wants to commit suicide he can't he can't do it anymore he can't he can't stand it anymore and that led my wife and i to write a book series as inspiration for vegan kids it, it's so just to to inspire vegan kids to continue the good fight so it's more than mere children's literature it's and it, life is funny it's it's um it's as steve jobs said you you can never connect the dots of your life looking forward it's only when you look back you see that the one thing led to the other and we made many mm -hmm. mistakes along the way you know uh, we took on way too much and then we have to refocus and redesign and so we're still in that process doing a lot of writing um i just wanted to put it out there our website is called veganism has one.com veganism has won like it has it has triumphed and it mm -hmm. and it all began with it winning in my life because i wanted to die and and it won in my life it gave me a purpose for living so that's where the website's name started and my book mm -hmm. is available on our website free of charge free of charge so if you're in sound of my voice and you want something good in a vegan space to read for free you can go to our website yeah. uh, we've also one of our children's books are on there called freya on the king is also available free of charge so um Please feel free to yeah to to go get those to go That's get your ebook your ebook copy of those uh, yeah those books. Uh, some of the feedback that we've had from vegan parents is that there there isn't a huge amount for vegan kids, um, and yeah. a lot that we've spoken to have had, uh, you know, their their kids have been homeschooled because um, because sure. of issues at school and stuff. So um, that's a that. That will be a great resource for some of our listeners to to uh, to to use for for some of their kids. So that's that's really great, fantastic. fantastic. Thank you so much for sharing that. That's um, that's really moving. There's nothing better than a hunk of prime Labrador steak, wonderfully marbled, and that is almost entirely dependent on how it's produced. Elwood's organic dog meat has complete control of this entire journey. So I'm here at Elwood's farm to find out a little more about it. Welcome to Elwood Farms. Thank you very much, Elwood. I hear you do a bit of barbecuing. I do a little bit of barbecuing every now and then, yes. From a chef's point of view, consistency is key for everything. It doesn't matter if it's a Rottweiler ribeye, a Pyrenees mince, or a lab sirloin. You can always tell when the dog comes from a place where it was well reared. And every step has to be right, doesn't it? <laughs> oh, you should see these guys! So, from an Elwood's point of view, there's complete traceability. Absolutely. Unrivaled traceability, so it's fine. Every single piece of dog meat? Yeah, from pub to farmer's market. Everything the dog's been fed? Everything about it. For each dog? Yeah. Only Marks and Spencer's and Whole Foods do this. Where else can people order from? From ElwoodDogMeat.com. That's E L W O O D. DogMeat.com. For top quality meat from dogs for people. Meat that's local, sustainable, and humanely harvested. There's only Elwood's organic dog meat. <laughs> they seem pretty friendly, don't they? They're more responsive to me than my kids, to be honest. One of the things that I'm really keen to explore is what the reaction was amongst your friends and family once you had the, um, you know, once you came to veganism and, you know, you left farming and animal agriculture, because obviously it's been in your family for 250 mm, years. Course. And on all of a sudden you're, you know, you've, you've uh, turned your yeah. back on it. Of course, what was the, What was their reaction? I was, um, well, both my wife and I we were quite fortunate that we never got a lot of backlash from them. 
um, I don't really know what they think. I can only suspect. I know, I know that they're not in favor of it. And I know initially when we were still on the farm that most of them were just sort of hoping that, that it was only a phase. It's going to, you know, yeah. blow over and we're going to, you know, get back get into back it into and it. take the, the, the farm the to farm new heights. Well. But we never had uh, any confrontation regarding the vegan thing. Of course, they hoped that it would blow over. It didn't. Um, so we are still in good communication with them. We still love one another. However, um, they don't really support us, not in a vegan course. For example, we had now written these, you know, several children's books and my own book. And, you know, you put a lot of effort in them love and life into those pages and then you send it out and you say hey friends hey family we've written this book and guess what it's available for free and you know how many of them have gone to our site to download it not a single one not a parent oh. nor a sibling <laughs> nothing so um yeah so that sort of paints a picture that they don't really support us in what we're doing, but that's okay. Such is life, and we've learned to live with it. And um, yeah, I guess. Mm -hmm. But we're still trying to build bridges, you know. And we still love one another. It's just when it comes to veganism, mm -hmm. we just don't see eye to eye. I guess. Sure. Mm -hmm. Have there been? Have you made? Have you met many other vegans? What's the sort of? Um vegan situation in south africa i know you said you live in a fairly remote place but do you have uh, any in your uh, you know if you come across anyone in your yeah. local community it's definitely on the up we always say it always feels to us as you know as south africans as we sort of 10 years behind the uk and the usa right so oh, right. the vegan movement is slowly but surely making inroads as i said at the age of 29 i've never even met a single vegan today i well i'm turning 35 in december and now we are part of like a big vegan group here in the garden route where we live of approximately 30 odd people you know who get together from time to time and we have vegan picnics and we have several wow. other vegan friends who live you know spread out through south africa and most restaurants in South Africa now have vegan options. We don't have many full-on vegan restaurants, for example, but, you know, we've got several sanctuaries. And, you know, so the movement is going. It's, we're getting there, yes? We're 10 years behind the UK, so I think what you should do is you should, you should um, remind yourself of maybe what the UK vegan movement was like 10 years ago, and then that was sort of paint a picture where we at. Yeah, so we are yeah. getting there slowly but surely. Yeah, well, um, ten years ago, neither of us were vegan, and um, oh. certainly wasn't a thing in supermarkets. You know, with the amount of uh, choice that you have in the various sections of the supermarket that you get now, ten years ago, for sure, nowhere near, sure. nowhere near. Of course, of course, of course. Yeah, no, we're getting there because I think then we may be ahead where you guys were 10 years ago because we now have several options in your supermarket. So it's, it's, not, it's, it's, it's not tough, man. It's easy to be a vegan in South Africa today. Yeah, you just, just got to choose compassion. Man. That's it. That's, That's what it. it's all about. <laughs> yeah. So where do you get your protein from these days? <laughs> <laughs> so uh, my wife and I will you know we stick to a very simple diet we love homemade seitan um, I don't know if you guys you know are into that but um, and we still do the traditional way of, of making it there's a lot of work let me tell you we we would spend like an hour and a half on a, on a Sunday afternoon and we put on some music and she'll make a batch and I'll make a batch and because it's you know, you take flour and then you add water and you sort of massage the starch out of it and then the protein stays behind. And that's a lot of protein, man, let me tell you. And it's, it tastes amazing. Uh, we don't miss meat whatsoever. So we do a lot of seitan. It's high in protein. And um, we've done the test, both my wife and I, we, are not, we don't have protein deficiency or anything like that. So we, we go in quite strong. <laughs> Then and now, you know, we'll, we'll try 
some of these meat replacements, you know, that you buy in the supermarkets, I'm not too keen on them. That's just for taste reasons. And then, you know, your basic nuts and so forth. But generally speaking, mm. when it comes to protein, man, it's, it's Satan all the way. <laughs> ah, brilliant. I love that. So um, you mentioned that there's um, some good uh, choices and you've got a bit of a community. Have you got any um, sort of venues or anything that you want to give a particular sort of shout out to that, that are particularly Gosh. accommodating for you? Um, well, unfortunately not, because as I said, we don't have um, yeah, yeah, nothing specific full on even. vegan restaurants. Yeah. So we're fortunate that most restaurants, for example, and coffee shops have vegan options and we're very grateful for it. But we're still very much in, you know, the trial and error phase. And as vegans, we will go and try something and then go to another place and try that. But we're still very much in the, and we would almost prefer the vegan picnics, you know, uh, mm. sort of go sit by the river or at the beach and get together you know around a campfire uh, as South Africans we love the outdoors so we're more into that so when it comes to restaurants specifically no, no specific shout out that I want to give I would like to say that um, you guys did give me a heads up about a favorite product that I would yeah. I would like to give these guys a shout out because there's a South African brand and I'm so proud of them it's uh, I don't know them personally. Let me say I'm not being yeah, you haven't got shares in it. No, that's fine. no, no, no shares, no <laughs> shares. Not yet. I don't. <laughs> it's called it's called a butter milk with with an A, not butter, but butter butter milk, and it's uh, and they mo they make the most divine oat milk, and it's by far my favorite product because I'm a I'm a coffee snob. So we just absolutely, <laughs> we only recently came across it and my wife and I, we are hooked. Buttermilk, it's a, a delicious oat milk, yeah. Ah, cool. Nice, okay. I don't think that's one that's come, um, uh, that's not come here yet, I don't think. No, um, if, I, if, I get, if I get my shares, I'll bring it over to <laughs> How about that? Yeah, <laughs> that's Absolutely. a deal. <laughs> So what advice would you give to someone if, you, if they came to you wanting to make the change? What would you say to them? Gosh, man. Um, please, please, for the love of all things pure, if it's on your heart to do it, do it. <laughs> Choose compassion, man. It's it's. It's easy. It's easy to choose compassion. If you've got a choice to choose either compassion or on the one side or blood and gore on the other, why on earth would he not choose compassion? So please, if it's on your heart to try and give it a go. If you struggle, reach out to us, man. I'll do a video call with you. I'll try I'll do my best to inspire you. But please give it a go. And from my perspective, please do it for the right reasons do it for the animals don't do it for for selfish reasons um if you do it for the animals it's easy and it's mm -hmm. very hard to fall away if i can put it so but we often hear of, of vegans who gave it up and, then I, and i i don't want to be over overtly critical but i i always ask myself you know what were their initial reasons for going vegan? Was it for the animals? Because I always think if you go vegan for the right reasons, for the animals, man, there's no turning back. Yeah, absolutely. That's it. You've got to keep the animals front and center. That's the thing that keeps us uh, keeps us in the right in the right lane. Absolutely. Yes. Love that. Okie dokie. Um, one of the questions that we often ask is, what's the best thing about being vegan? But um, I think for me now, it's having spoken to you. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but for you, what's the best thing about being vegan? <laughs> um, I never really sit down and take stock, to be quite honest with you. But just thinking about it in the moment, it's, man, I'm still alive. This, to me, mm -hmm. I don't want to sound overly dramatic, but to me, this is borrowed time. And I wake up every morning and I remind myself of that fact, because to me, it's a fact. 
from my perspective, I'm not supposed to be here anymore. And it really gave me a reason to be here, to continue living. So I'm, I'm just so grateful, man. I really do my best to live a life of gratitude. And it comes quite easy having, having sort of seen what I've seen. Um, I'm humbled by it. So I guess the fact that I'm still here that's, is the best thing for me about being vegan. Hundred mm. percent, man. That's a great answer. Oh dear. Okay. So I'm just trying. I'm just. I'm just getting through another minute. Um. <laughs> so, uh, who's your vegan inspiration? And you're being pretty damn inspirational. Right yeah, now, yeah. So, <laughs> who's, who's, oh, man. Oh, guys. Oh, that's that's why kind. I paused. That's why I was pausing because I was trying to think how to yeah. word too it. Kind. But, You're too but yeah, kind. Who, You're who's, too who's kind. your vegan inspiration? Well, let me put it to this way: somebody who I really admire in the vegan space, and I can't stretch this enough, is Moby, the mm. singer, right? Um, and I had the honor of of being on his podcast about a month ago. And really? I was complete. I was completely starstruck. Yeah, it, because I I love the music and I love the human, and just I'm just in awe of of that guy. Especially because I mean I have nothing to lose because I'm not famous. But that guy was. I mean, he's this, this big name, and um, and he's just choosing to live this bold vegan life with the animal liberation tattoos and he just doesn't care who says what and he's just and just doing massive you know positive work in the vegan movement so i i yeah I, i'm really just inspired by him um i guess most of all yeah he is a legend and you're on his podcast i listened to that podcast when is it out is it gone out now? It's 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 not out. They they said okay. that um, they'll let me know. Apparently, it will be released at some. I think in either November or December. They said at the end right. of the year. So they only release one episode per month. So they said at the end of the year. So. Um, oh, so we can man, jump the queue. Yes. Yes. We can jump ahead queue. of Moby, and then we can just pretend that. <laughs> well, I'll edit this bit out. And I'll just say that Moby heard you on our pod and thought, I've got to get this guy on. Of course, of course, of course. Let's do that then. Yeah, I'll play along. <laughs> oh, Fantastic. Man. Oh, wow. I mean, getting to meet, uh, I know virtually, but still, but getting to talk to someone, you know, with that sort of kudos within the movement is incredible, though. That must no, have been I'm a hard moment. More importantly, sorry, more importantly, did you get to meet Bagel? No, I didn't. I didn't. I oh. didn't. Um, no, 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 no. I got to meet him and his partner, Lindsay. So yeah. that was it. Um, but let me tell you, talk about a humbling experience. Uh, it was, yeah, anyway. Um, but <laughs> let me just say, let me just say, you guys are awesome too. All right. <laughs> Let's just put it out there, man. You guys are inspiring me so much. I just went to, you know, when we took a quick break, I went up to to just go have a quick word with my wife. And I just said, man, these guys. And I said, I told them, whenever we go to the UK, if they come down to South Africa, we must meet up. You know, it's so inspiring meeting you guys and seeing, you know, take time out of your busy schedules to keep this brilliant podcast going. It's, it's marvelous, the work that you guys are doing. We will definitely add South Africa to our forthcoming world tour. Um, Fantastic. Yeah. Yeah. Fantastic. <laughs> and you do that, and you've got a place to stay here by us. All right. Happy day. Oh, Fantastic. thank you very much. So, um, again, this feels like a bit of a moot question because um, I feel like you've given all of us some hope. But one of the things that we've that we've experienced ourselves and a lot of our guests have experienced is uh, Vistopia, which is the, you know, the, the anguish of vegans that vegans feel living in a non-vegan world, which you've mm. described yeah. very vividly this evening about the, the anguish that you felt uh, as being a, a vegan 
in a explicitly non-vegan not just a world but your immediate um environment but do you have any hope for the future of of veganism of course of course it gets tough sometimes doesn't it i mean you guys mm-hmm. know i mean it's so easy to fall into sort of an nihilistic view of the world but I just fight for that hope, man. I, I just, I just, ha- I just don't give myself an out. I, I don't have another choice. I, I get up early in the morning, and I know because I, I come from a background of severe depression, as I explained to you guys. Mm-hmm. So I know that if I don't get up early in the morning and, and spend some time working on my mental health, I am going to survive it. So I wake up early every morning, and there's nothing good in me. It's just a way of, it's just a surviving mechanism right and i meditate on that hope on finding and searching for that hope and finding the light in this dark reality that is a non-vegan world so i just i just don't give myself an out so yes am i hopeful immensely so i'm inspired you know talking to you know guys such as yourself here we are like-minded individuals from two different hemispheres literally on you know the opposite side of the world um so i'm hopeful man i'm hopeful tonight um we're gonna get it i think i just always remind myself that when it comes to veganism i'm on the right side of history and and that's an honor man and that's a reason to continue the good fight so am i hopeful there was a long way of saying yes indeed so <laughs> i love that um, nice, man. yeah i've been feeling quite um environmentally um depressed recently but um someone mentioned to me that um just up oil i like uh, i they they're a sort of a protest group here um in the uk especially and and yeah, across yeah. europe as well I, but, I know um, of them, yeah. Yeah, Just Stop Oil, for example, are kind of like today's suffragettes mm-hmm. um, because they're currently doing things that are often illegal and often extremely unpopular, but they're on the right side. Sure. Yeah. Wow. And and we're in we're in that boat as well because we're the ones that are doing something completely different outside of what's expected of us. Wow. And and yet but but we're in the end people will realize oh actually do you know what they they were right all along wow and may it come soon man i believe it will happen a major shift will happen in our lifetime so but but yeah but what what a privilege man i i always just say tell myself that listen jay you get to live this vegan life it's don't see it as a hassle it's you get to be on the right side of history. You get to speak for the voiceless victims. Don't, don't even allow your mind to go to a place, you know, where it's nihilistic or where it's tough or it's where you, where you get depressed about it. Just, I just always remind myself, man, you get to live it. It's, it's, it's an honor. Man. It's, it's anyway. Mm. It's, that's yeah, it. Oh, Absolutely. <laughs> and that seems like a, a fantastic place to finish because that's been you've been such an inspiration that's been absolutely fascinating talking to you jh um thank you so much for taking the time to um to to talk to us it's been absolutely fantastic yeah thank and you so much it's been a pleasure again to speak with you guys thank you so and, much uh, for having me i i really do appreciate it you are such kind gentle souls and It was a massive honor sitting down with you. Wow. Holy moly. That was just. I didn't know what to expect. I didn't know what to expect going into that. Connor wasn't expecting that at all. Man alive. He's just blown my mind there. What? Yeah. What a guy. What a guy. I, thought, I think I might have said this before, but um, it's always good to quit at the top of your game. Is is this the last episode? <laughs> no, 
No. You want to see who we've got lined up for our next oh, episode. No, after this I know. One. I saw Jeez. the calendar who we've got next. Oh, my God. <laughs> It'll be a whole different story, that one. Jesus. But this is, uh, man, oh, th- man, that was absolutely fantastic. And um, definitely check out his website, check out his book. And um, yeah. yeah, and if you've listened to this, uh, then um, check him out on these Moby podcasts because Moby heard him yeah. on our chat and copied it and thought, what a great idea to get him on. Oh, God, can you imagine? Oh. So um, I'm going to say this. Um, you, you, you don't know I'm going to say this. So you can edit whatever you want out of this bit, but can't wait. Um, if anyone was affected by anything that was mentioned in that, yes, can you please make sure you take care of yourself? Um, we are. I'm going to tell Matthew now to put. We're going to put another <laughs> a little warning at the beginning. Um, yeah. But yeah, if if you were affected by anything that was mentioned in that, can you please just make sure you're okay? And if you need to talk to somebody, go and do so. Thank you very much. Um, apart from that, if anybody wants to get in touch or wants to come on the podcast or ask us any questions, um, then, yeah, get in touch with us. Send us a message. We're on all the social medias that I think we're on um, or whichever ones you do follow us on. Just send us a message. Do it. Or send us an email to howivegan.podcast at gmail.com. Thank you for listening, chaps and chapesses. You have a good day. See you later. I just, I'm a mess. Uh, I'm a mess. Oh, that's hilarious.